Thank you. Thank you so much. It is such a tremendous honor to be with you this evening. Professor Helfeld, thank you for that incredible introduction. You are a hero to me and I am sure to every person in this room. I want to thank the class of 2013 and the Business Law Journal for inviting me here. I want to thank Jorge for all he did to make it possible. I had the opportunity today to have lunch with your terrific dean and many of your wonderful faculty, and I thank them for their warm and gracious hospitality. Neptune and I have been talking about ways in which we can have collaboration between the University of Puerto Rico Law School and the University of California at Irvine School of Law, and I so look forward to it. Thank you all for coming this evening. Um, I feel bad as I see people standing around the room. I was asked to talk for about an hour. That's a long time to stand, especially to listen to me. So if you want to sit down while you're listening, um, I'm pretty confident the fire marshals aren't going to come in in the next hour. <laughs> John Thompson spent 18 and a half years in prison, most of them on death row, for murders that he did not commit. At the time of his trial, one of the assistant district attorneys was given blood evidence. This was a pair of jeans that Thompson was allegedly wearing at the time of an armed robbery that was linked to the murders. The law is clear that the assistant district attorney was obligated to give that blood evidence to the defense lawyers for testing. In Brady v. Maryland in 1963, the Supreme Court held that prosecutors are obligated by the Constitution to turn over potentially exculpatory evidence to defense lawyers. The law of professional responsibility in every state makes it clear that prosecutors have this important obligation. However, the assistant district attorney didn't turn over that blood evidence. Instead, he hid it. Many years later, when that assistant district attorney was literally on his deathbed, he confessed to another assistant district attorney what he had done with the blood evidence. That assistant district attorney told no one. Only weeks before Thompson's scheduled execution, through a series of coincidences, his lawyers learned of the blood evidence. They had it tested. It not only didn't match Thompson's DNA, it didn't match his blood type. A new trial was held. A number of witnesses came forward. Thompson was acquitted. And all observers said it was clear that he was not guilty of those murders that he had been convicted for. Thompson sued the then district attorney of New Orleans, Harry Connick, and sued the city, saying they had violated his constitutional rights. And the city didn't deny that the lawyers were obligated by the Constitution to turn over the blood evidence. The jury found in Thompson's favor they gave him a large judgment. The United States Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit affirmed. Last spring, the Supreme Court, in a five to four decision, reversed. Justice Clarence Thomas wrote the opinion for the court. He was joined by Chief Justice John Roberts and Justice Scalia, Kennedy, and Alito. Justice Thomas said, this is only one incident of a constitutional violation by the district attorney's office said you can't hold a city or its district attorney liable if there's only one incident. Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg wrote an impassioned dissent. She said, how can it be said it was just one incident? She said, five different assistant district attorneys over an 18-year period knew of this blood evidence, and not one of them spoke up. She said, this wasn't the only constitutional violation in terms of hiding evidence in this case. Turns out that the police had an eyewitness to the murders. And the eyewitness described the assailant as having short hair. At the time of the murders, at the time of his arrest, Thompson had a large afro. No one disclosed that to the defense lawyers, though the Constitution required it. Justice Ginsburg pointed out there's a long pattern, similar constitutional violations by the New Orleans District Attorney's Office. How could it be just one incident? In 
Alpha Thompson, despite spending 18 and a half years in prison for murders he didn't commit, will now get no recovery whatsoever. I begin with this example because it's recent. I begin with this example because it says so much about the present state of constitutional rights in the United States. I think it illustrates a Supreme Court that's quite insensitive to the rights of individuals, a court that's very deferential to the government, a court that, as I want to talk about, is increasingly closing the courthouse doors to people who need it, to people like John Thompson. What I'd like to do this evening is talk about the current court, where it is and where it's likely to go in the foreseeable future. It's a way of talking about the present state of constitutional rights in the United States. What I'd like to do is identify for you six themes about the current court. The first, I think, is important for context. The Supreme Court is deciding many fewer cases than it used to. There has been a dramatic downsizing in the Supreme Court's docket. Through much of the 20th century, the Supreme Court was deciding over 200 cases a year. As recently as the 1980s, the Supreme Court was deciding over 160 cases a year. Last year, the Supreme Court decided 75 cases after briefing oral argument. This year, the most that the court could decide after briefing oral argument is 70 cases. It likely won't be that many. Inevitably, some cases settle before decision. The court dismisses some cases as review having been improvidently granted. So we're likely to see a term where 67 or 68 cases are being decided. This is enormously important in literally every area of law. It means more major legal issues go a longer time before being resolved. More conflicts among the circuits and the states go a longer time before being settled. And there is another more pernicious aspect to the reduced docket. As the number of cases has gone down, the average length of opinions has gone up. I can show you a perfect inverse correlation. As the number of decisions decreases, the average length of opinions, as measured by words per opinion and pages per opinion, increases. Now, I'm not sure what's cause and what's effect. Is the Supreme Court taking fewer cases because the justices want to write longer opinions? Was I would guess, are they writing longer opinions because they have fewer cases? You might have seen an article in the New York Times last year by Adam Liptak that documented that the term before set the all-time record in American history with regard to average length of opinions. I did the arithmetic last summer, and last term was number two of all of the years in American history in terms of average length of opinions. One of the things that I have to do every summer is for the annual supplements to my constitutional law and criminal procedure casebooks. There is just no way to edit 185 a page opinion, as we recently saw from the Supreme Court, let alone a 200 page opinion, as we recently saw from the Supreme Court, and an assignment managed for law students in one night without making a hash of it. So I've decided to start a new campaign, and I can't think of any better place for it to begin than the law school, where law students have to read these cases. So I think we should get together and work to create word and page limits on the United States Supreme Court. <laughs> the second theme that I would identify for you is that when it matters most, it's the Anthony Kennedy Court. I know out of tradition, in deference to the chief, we refer to this as the John Roberts Court. But in practical reality, for the lawyers who stand before the justice and write briefs to them, this is the Anthony Kennedy Court. Last term, Justice Kennedy voted in the majority more than any other justice, 94% of the time. But you really see that it's the Kennedy Court by focusing on the five, four decisions. After all, those are usually the most controversial and the most important.
For each of the years in which John Roberts has been Chief Justice, Anthony Kennedy is the majority in more 5-4 decisions than either justice. Last year, there were 16 5-4 decisions. Justice Kennedy was in the majority in 14, the most of any justice. The year before that, there were 17 5-4 decisions. Justice Kennedy was in the majority in 14, the most of any justice. The year before that, there were 23 5-4 decisions. Justice Kennedy was in the majority in 18, the most of any justice. And the year before that, there were 24 5-4 decisions. Justice Kennedy was the majority in literally every one of them. So for the lawyer, there's often the sense of arguing to an audience of one. I'm co-counsel this term in a case before the Supreme Court. It's a case called Kiable versus Dutch Petroleum. The issue is whether or not corporations can be sued for international human rights violations under the Federal Alien Tort Statute. I can tell you, in the privacy of this room, that our brief was a shameless attempt to pander to Justice Kennedy. If we could have put Justice Kennedy's picture on the front of our brief, we would have done so. And our brief was not unique among those filed in this case. This case is not unique among those on the docket. Everyone knows, even the justices know, that it's the Kennedy court. I am often asked, how conservative is the Roberts court? Well, I think I've come up with an easy measure of that by focusing on Anthony Kennedy. After all, what makes this the Kennedy court is there are four conservative justices who are as conservative as any who have been on the Supreme Court since the mid-1930s. And John Roberts, Antonin Scalia, Clarence Thomas, and Samuel Alito. And there are four liberal justices who usually vote together as a block when the court's ideologically divided. Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Stephen Breyer, Sonia Sotomayor, and Elena Kagan. That's what makes Justice Kennedy the swing justice. So where does he usually line up when the court splits ideologically? I've counted this. For example, last year, there were 14 ideologically divided 5-4 decisions. Kennedy was with the conservatives in 10 and the liberals in 4. The year before that, there were 12 ideologically divided 5-4 decisions. Kennedy was the conservatives in 9 and the liberals in 3. If you add this up, for all of the years since John Roberts became Chief Justice, Justice Kennedy votes with the conservatives almost 75% of the time when the court is ideologically divided 5-4. to four. Third major theme. What difference has Elena Kagan made for the Supreme Court? One might ask more generally, what difference has the Obama presidency made for the Supreme Court? After all, the biggest difference on the Supreme Court last year and this year, compared to the terms before, is that John Paul Stevens retired from the court at the age of 90, after 35 years on that bench. And he's replaced by a 50-year-old justice, Elena Kagan. In almost every case, in her year and three quarters on the Supreme Court, Justice Kagan has voted the same way that we would have expected that Justice Stevens would have voted. In one sense, this is no surprise. In another sense, we've got to remember that we knew less about Elena Kagan's judicial philosophy than anyone confirmed for the Supreme Court, at least since Sandra O'Connor in 1981. Every justice confirmed after 1981 was a federal court of appeals judge. Most had spent a long time on the bench before going to the Supreme Court. Elena Kagan had never been a judge on any court before being put on the United States Supreme Court. By no means is this disqualifying. Many justices through history had never been on any court before becoming a Supreme Court justice. Think of Brandeis, Black, Douglas, Frankfurter, Jackson, Earl Warren, Goldberg, Fortas, most recently Rehnquist and Powell. None of them had ever been a judge before being put on the high court. But the fact that Elena Kagan had never been a judge means that we didn't have prior judicial opinions to scrutinize to get a sense of her judicial philosophy. As a law professor, she wrote only five major law review articles, and none said anything particularly controversial. Unlike some law professors, 
She never wrote an op-ed in a newspaper or gave a controversial statement to a reporter. That probably explains why she's where she's at and the other law professors aren't. <laughs> Quite predictably, the confirmation hearings gave us no sense of her judicial philosophy. My favorite moment in the confirmation hearings occurred on the Tuesday when South Carolina Senator Lindsey Graham said to her, quote, where are you on Christmas? She responded, like most Jews, I'm in a Chinese restaurant. <laughs> it was such a quick and witty answer, but gave us little sense of her judicial philosophy. This was President Obama's second pick for the court. The year before Justice Stevens retired, David Souter announced his resignation, the young age for a justice of 69 years old. He was replaced by Sonia Sotomayor. In her year, in, to now two and three quarters years on the Supreme Court, she has been a consistently liberal vote and a very powerful liberal voice. Ruth Bader Ginsburg is now the oldest of the justices. She turned 79 last month. Perhaps because she's frail in appearance, there's always speculation that she might step down. I first met her in 1986 when she was a judge on the DC circuit. She was frail in appearance even then, so I don't give too much weight to that factor. Stephen Breyer is 73 years old. Take a moment to think of the other side of the ideological aisle. John Roberts turned 57 in January of this year. If he remains on the Supreme Court until he's 90 years old, he'll be the Chief Justice until the year 2045. Samuel Alito turned 62 at the beginning of this month on April 1st. Clarence Thomas has now been on the Supreme Court for 20 years, but he will just turn 64 on June 23rd of this year. Both Antonin Scalia and Anthony Kennedy are 75 years old. I think the best predictor of a long lifespan is being confirmed for a seat on the United States Supreme Court. So even if there's a second Obama term, I don't expect that there will be a vacancy from among the conservative bloc of Roberts, Scalia, Kennedy, Thomas Alito. The vacancies for President Obama are Souter and Stevens and maybe Ginsburg, and that won't change the ideology of the court. When Byron White was a justice on the Supreme Court, he said every time there's a new justice, it's a different court. It's easy to imagine that's why it's so. Change one member of a small group and its dynamics are altered. The Supreme Court we have now is different from any before we've had in American history. Now, for the first time in American history, there are three women justices. And Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Sonia Sotomayor, and Elena Kagan. Now, for the first time in American history, there are no Protestant justices on the Supreme Court. There are six Catholic justices, and three Jewish justices. And now I think for the first time in American history, there are four justices at the same time who spent most of their careers before going on the bench as law professors. Antonin Scalia, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Stephen Breyer, and Elena Kagan were primarily academics before becoming judges. And I think that's why the opinions keep getting longer with ever more footnotes. <laughs> My fourth theme is this is the most pro-business Supreme Court that there's been since the mid-1930s. Now, another way of answering the question of why might the Business Law Journal sponsor a talk about the Supreme Court is there has not been a court that has been so pro-corporate rights and so pro-business since the New Deal Court since the court changed in 1937. Rather than talk about this in the abstract, let me give you some examples that show how much this is a pro-business court. I want to pick my examples just from the last year, though I could select so many more illustrations from the now almost seven terms of the John Roberts Court. These are cases that might be familiar to you. Many of them affect all of us. One case that I would use as an illustration from last term is called AT&T Mobility versus Concepcion. AT&T was advertising free cell phones. 
the Concepcions saw the ad and they went and got their free phones. They, like all of us, had to sign an agreement for their cell phones. They, my guess is, like most of us, didn't read the agreements they were signing. Had they done so, they would have seen a clause that said if they had any claims against AT&T arising from the cell phones, they would have to go to arbitration. They couldn't go to court. The Concepcions were surprised when they got their first monthly bills. They were each charged $30.22 in sales tax. They believed that since AT&T had promised free cell phones, AT&T should have to absorb those costs. They learned of a class action in federal court against AT&T for fraud on just that basis. They wanted to join that class action. But AT&T moved to enforce the arbitration clause in their agreements. AT&T invoked a 1925 federal statute, the Federal Arbitration Act. It says that if there's a contract in interstate commerce with an arbitration clause, that clause shall be enforced unless it's revocable under state law. The California Supreme Court had ruled in the Discover Bank case that routine arbitration clauses in consumer contracts are not enforceable. The California Supreme Court referred to them as, quote, contracts of adhesion. The United States Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit ruled that the Concepcions did not have to go to arbitration because this was a provision that was revocable under state law. The Supreme Court, in a five to four decision, reversed. Justice Scalia wrote for the court, joined by Chief Justice Roberts and Justice Kennedy Thomas and Alito. Justice Scalia spoke of the benefits of arbitration over court adjudication in terms of efficiency. He spoke of the ill effects of class actions on businesses. He described, quote, the interim effect of class actions on corporations, force them to settle even non-meritorious class suits. The court held that California law was preempted, that the Concepcions would have to go to arbitration. Justice Breyer wrote a vehement dissent. He said the alternative here isn't hundreds of thousands or millions of separate claims against AT&T in arbitration. He said the alternative is few, if any, claims against AT&T. He said the reality is that people won't file a claim, even in arbitration, for $30.22. He said when well, we need class actions, situations like this, where a large number of people each lose a small amount of money. This case is so important for all of us because arbitration clauses are increasingly ubiquitous. They're found in consumer contracts, like in this case, in employment contracts, even in medical contracts. Not long ago, I went to see a new eye doctor for the first time, and the receptionist gave me a big stack of papers to fill out. In the middle of them was a form that I was asked to sign that if I had any claims against the doctor arising out of the treatment, I would agree that I would go to arbitration, and I couldn't go to court. So I asked the receptionist, would the doctor still see me if I didn't sign the form? She said she didn't know. Nobody had ever asked her that question before. <laughs> Around the same time, I bought a new Dell computer. As you know, in order to use a computer or an iPad for the first time, you have to click that you've read the terms and agree to them. And I'm sure I'm like everyone else. I usually just click agree so I can use the machine. But in this instance, I read the terms. And sure enough, there was a clause that said that if any claims against Dell arising out of the use of the computer, I would have to go to arbitration. I couldn't go to court. Well, I wrote Dell a letter that said I did not agree to that paragraph. And by opening the envelope of my letter, Dell was agreeing I could sue them if we had any dispute. <laughs> Dell did not write back, but the computer still works. <laughs> Another illustration of the court's pro-corporate bias is a case from June 2011, Walmart versus Dukes. This was a class action by as many as 1.5 million women employees of Walmart claiming that the company engaged in gender discrimination 
in pay and promotion. In the most important part of the holding, the court ruled five to four that the matter could not go forward as a class action. Once more, Justice Scalia wrote here, joined by the same four justices, Roberts, Kennedy, Thomas, and Alito. Justice Scalia said in order for there to be a class action, under Rule 23 of the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure, there has to be commonality. He said that Walmart had an official policy prohibiting gender discrimination in hiring, pay, and promotion. He said, therefore, if Walmart engaged in gender discrimination, it was decisions of separate store managers and assistant managers across the country. He simply ignored all of the evidence that the district court judge relied on in certifying the class. There was a corporate culture in Walmart that had long discriminated against women. This is going to make employment discrimination class actions very difficult. Those who bring such class actions are going to have to look for the Goldilocks of classes. If it's a small workplace where hiring decisions are made by one or two people, then there's not going to be the numerosity required for a class action. But if it's a large workplace, say like my university, where hiring pay promotion decisions are made in departments and schools across campus, then there's not going to be the commonality for a class action suit. In fact, the Supreme Court for the first time said that the standard for class certification is a rigorous one, that the usual standard for admissibility of evidence has to be met at the class certification standard. There is no doubt that the court in these two cases was concerned about large class action suits. But where was the concern about the fact that the defendants were Walmart and AT&T, two of the largest corporations in American history? and the need for a class remedy against large corporations like this. I want to give you one more example of the court's pro-corporate bias, a decision from last term, and one that got a lot less media attention than AT&T Mobility versus Concepcion or Walmart versus Dukes, but one that might affect everyone in this room even more directly. It's a case called Pleva versus Mensing, decided on June 23rd, 2011. The issue is whether or not makers of generic drugs can be sued for failure to adequately warn patients. What's interesting is two years earlier, in a case called Wyeth versus Levine, the Supreme Court held that drug companies can be sued on a failure to warn theory. You might have read Wyeth versus Levine in some of your classes. It involved a professional musician in the state of Vermont, Diane Levine, who was suffering from a severe migraine. She went to a hospital emergency room for treatment. She was given the drug Demerol to counteract her pain, her nausea, her pain, and a drug called Phenergan to counteract her nausea. Phenergan is known as a highly corrosive substance. It's supposed to be given diluted in a saline solution through an IV drip is given directly to her in a shot. She developed gangrene in her arm, and her arm had to be amputated. She sued the drug company Wyeth for failing to adequately warn patients. Wyeth defended by arguing that any such tort claim was preempted by federal law. Wyeth said that its warning label had been approved by the Food and Drug Administration, so it couldn't be sued for failure to adequately warn doctors or patients. The Supreme Court 6-3 to three ruled in favor of Diane Levine. Justice Stevens wrote for the court. He said, drug companies can always engage in more speech to warrant physicians and patients. He said, drug companies take out ads all the time on TV and in newspapers. Those ads could warn patients about side effects. Drug companies can send dear doctor letters to physicians to warn them of newly discovered side effects. Drug companies can ask the FDA to change the warning label. Well, the issue in Cleva versus Mensing was whether makers of generic drugs can be sued on a failure to warn theory. Case involves a drug that was often prescribed for those with diabetes to speed digestion. It's now known that a significant percentage of prolonged users, 30%, will suffer horrible irreversible neurological side effects. 
The drug now has the so-called black box warning, the strongest warning for any prescription drug. Cleaver versus Mensing involved two women in different parts of the country who had used the drug and suffered awful neurological side effects. They sued on a failure to warn theory. The Supreme Court ruled five to four that makers of generic drugs cannot be sued for failing to adequately warn patients. Justice Thomas wrote for the court, joined by Chief Justice Roberts, Justice Scalia, Justice Thomas, and Alito. Uh, Justice Kennedy, you know, just the lead up. Justice Thomas, writing for the court here, said, there's a federal statute, the Hatchet-Waxman Amendments, that say that generic drugs can be sold if they're chemically the same as brand name drugs and if they have the same warning label that the FDA had approved for brand name drugs. Justice Thomas said, therefore, the generic drug has to have just the warning label approved for brand name drugs so it can't be sued for failing to adequately warn consumers. Justice Sotomayor wrote a vehement dissent. She said, this makes absolutely no sense. That for the same chemical compound, the same drug, the maker of the brand name version can be sued, but the maker of the generic drug can't be sued. She said the statute that's relied on by the majority, the Hatch-Waxman Amendment, was meant to protect consumers. And now it's undermining their ability to sue. The reason this case matters so much is that 75% of all prescriptions in the United States are filled with generic drugs. If there is a generic equivalent to the brand name, that goes up to 90%. None of the users of these generic drugs, none of us can ever sue for failure to warn on how serious and how devastating the injury. The fifth theme that I want to identify for you about the current court is the way in which it's closing the courthouse doors to those who are asserting constitutional claims. If I was to describe for you any single theme about the Roberts Court, it would be about the way in which the courthouse doors are being slammed shut on those with constitutional, and for that matter, other claims. If you were to ask me, what's the single most important decision since John Roberts became Chief Justice, I would say without hesitation, it's the case of Ashcroft versus Iqbal in 2009. My guess is that all of you in your civil procedure classes have read it and talked about it. In fact, it's not only the most frequently cited case from the John Roberts era. If you were to make a list of all of the Supreme Court cases in history, it's now among the top Five most frequently cited by lower federal courts in all of American history. And the case is just three years old next month. From the time the federal rules of civil procedure were adopted in the 1930s, it was said that they ushered in a system of notice pleading. And as you all learn in civil procedure, the philosophy of notice pleading is that all that a plaintiff should have to put in a complaint is a short plain statement of the facts, enough so that it can't be said that relief is impossible. I've taught civil procedure many times. I was instructing my students that the embodiment of notice pleading, it's a case in 1956, Conley versus Gibson, which said just that, that all that's required is enough that it can't be said it's impossible that the plaintiff can recover. But then in 2007, in a case called Bell Atlantic versus Twombly, the majority said that Conley versus Gibson was, quote, abrogated. The dissent said that Conley versus Gibson was, quote, interred. Now, the court didn't use the words were overruled, but I would assume that abrogate and inter are synonyms for overruled. And yet, there was still a basis for believing that Bell Atlantic versus Twombly was just about what had to be in the complaint in an antitrust case. It was about pleading in a case under Section 1 of the Sherman Act for conspiracy and restraint of trade. In November of 2008, there was a national conference of Federal Court of Appeals judges. For each topic, there was a Supreme Court justice and two law professors. For the panel on civil litigation, Justice Breyer was there, 
I was surprised to hear some of the Federal Court of Appeals judges with frustration, even anger in their voice, say to Justice Breyer, what's the standard of pleading? The standard for a motion to dismiss in federal court after Bell Atlantic versus Twombly. Finally, Justice Breyer responded with frustration, even anger in his voice, that Bell Atlantic versus Twombly was just about pleading in antitrust cases. Well, we learned six months later that Justice Breyer was wrong. Ashcroft versus Iqbal involved a man of Pakistani descent who was detained in New York after September 11th. After he was released, he brought a lawsuit against the Attorney General, the Director of the FBI, and others, saying his detention violated the Constitution. The Attorney General moved to dismiss under Federal Rule of Civil Procedure 12b-6 for failure to state a claim upon which relief can be granted. The Supreme Court ruled five to four that Iqbal's complaint should have been dismissed. Justice Kennedy wrote, joined by Robert Scalia, Thomas, and Alito. Justice Kennedy said that the new standard of pleading in a federal court is plausibility. The plaintiff must put enough in the complaint that the district court can conclude that it's plausible that the plaintiff might recover. Now, I've always taught my students that when a federal court assesses a motion to dismiss, it's supposed to accept all of the allegations and the complaint is true. Justice Kennedy said no longer is that the case. He said conclusory allegations of fact aren't to be accepted as true. To see how radical this is a change in the law, pick up any copy of the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure and look at the model complaints placed there by the Federal Rules Advisory Committee. Every one of them would have to be dismissed because nothing but conclusory allegations. The question, of course, is what does plausibility mean? All the Supreme Court said was plausibilities were decided by the judge based on context and common sense. The Federal Judicial Center in Washington has recently done a statistical study that has documented a significant increase in motions to dismiss being made and more troubling, a quite significant increase in their being granted, especially in civil rights cases. The philosophy of the federal rules is that it should be easy for the plaintiff to get to court, to get his or her day in federal court, and then have the chance through discovery to get the evidence to prove the claims. But now many plaintiffs will be excluded from ever having a day in court just because they don't have the evidence when they file their complaint. Another example from last year of closing the courthouse doors is a case that got far too little media attention. It's a case called Arizona School Tuition Organization versus Wynn. Arizona adopted a law that allowed individuals to get a $500 tax credit if they gave money to what was called a school tuition organization. A challenge was brought that this violated the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment. The United States Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit ruled in favor of the challengers. The statistics showed that almost all of this money went to Catholic parochial schools and evangelical Christian parochial schools. The Ninth Circuit said that the state had acted with the purpose and the effect of advancing religion. The United States Supreme Court reversed in a five to four decision. Justice Kennedy wrote for the court, once more joined by Robert Scalia, Thomas, and Alito. In 1968, in Flast versus Cohn, the Supreme Court said that taxpayers have standing to come to federal court to argue that government expenditure money violates the Establishment Clause. Chief Justice Earl Warren said, that the Establishment Clause was meant to be a limit on the ability of the government to tax and spend in a manner that advanced religion. But Justice Kennedy, writing for the court, said, taxpayers have standing to challenge government expenditure of money is violating the Establishment Clause. Taxpayers don't have standing to challenge tax credits is violating the Establishment Clause. Justice Elena Kagan wrote an impassioned dissent. She said, this makes no sense. She said, the Arizona law has meant that $500 million that would have otherwise been in the state treasury 
is now in the coffers of religious institutions. She said that the government can now give unlimited amounts of money to religious institutions or purchasing religious icons just by giving tax credits. Had the Supreme Court held that the government can give unlimited amounts of money to religious institutions, that would have made the headlines of every newspaper. But when the Supreme Court says no one has standing to challenge the government giving money to religious institutions, no one pays any attention. The court can and does undermine constitutional rights in a way that's invisible to the public just by closing the courthouse doors. One more example of this from last term. Another case that received almost no media attention, but should have made headlines. This is a case called Ashcroft versus Al-Kid. Abdul Al-Kid was apprehended at Chicago O'Hare's airport. He was arrested on a material witness warrant. As you may know, there's a federal statute that allows a judge to issue a warrant if somebody held as a material witness, if their testimony is likely to be essential, and if there's a substantial flight risk. A kid was taken, after his arrest, to a federal maximum security prison. He was then transferred to two other federal maximum security prisons. When he was transported, he was always in handcuffs and shackles. When he was released, he was placed under house arrest. He lost his job. His wife left him. He was never used as a material witness. Turns out that there was never any desire to use him as a material witness. The material witness warrant was a pretext. The material witness warrant was to hold him so he might be questioned by a friend of his who was suspected of supporting terrorist activity. He was never suspected of any crime. He was never arrested for any crime. Of course, never indicted or convicted. He brought a lawsuit against the Attorney General, John Ashcroft, saying that his rights were violated. To arrest him to be a material witness, there's no desire to use him as a material witness, was an illegal arrest in violation of the Fourth Amendment. The United States Court of Appeals to the Ninth Circuit ruled in Al-Kid's favor. The opinion was written by Judge Mylon Smith. I mention him by name because he was an appointee of President George W. Bush. By no account is he thought to be a liberal justice. But he said that any government officer let alone the Attorney General of the United States, should know that a person can't be arrested on a material witness warrant if there's no desire to hold the person as a material witness. The Supreme Court reversed an opinion by Justice Scalia. Justice Scalia said it doesn't matter what the underlying motives were in arresting him, so long as there was a valid warrant, it's lawful under the Fourth Amendment. Justice Scalia said the Attorney General couldn't be sued for money damages because there's no case on point that it violated the Constitution to use the material witness statute in this way. Justice Ginsburg said in her dissent, how could it be argued that there was a valid warrant here when the federal authorities never told the magistrate judge that a kid's wife and children were American citizens? The federal authorities never told the magistrate judge that a kid was fully cooperating with federal authorities and already answering questions for his friends. How could it be said there's a valid warrant to hold him as a material witness if there's never any desire to use him as a material witness? And yet the Supreme Court denied any recovery to tell kid, just like it did to John Thompson, just like it closed the courthouse doors to the Concepcions, or to the women who were discriminated against in Walmart, or to those who suffer from generic drugs in Pleva versus Mensing. We have the illusion in the United States, that any person who's injured will have his or her day in court. But increasingly, the Supreme Court, which I with the present state of constitutional rights, is making that a myth. My sixth and final theme this evening is that this term and next term of the Supreme Court are likely to be blockbusters to most unprecedented degree. When you think about what's the Supreme Court right now and what's going to be there next year, you can see why this is so. There are four matters that are pending. Two are on the docket for this term, 
One has been granted review for next term, and another is sure to be there, that are likely to affect the lives of everyone in the United States and likely to shape how the Supreme Court is perceived, maybe as never before, or at least not for decades. I think that each of these four matters should be easy for the Supreme Court. When we think of this court and the present state of constitutional rights in the United States, it's much harder to make a prediction about what will happen. One of these cases is the United States Department of Health and Human Services versus State of Florida. The issue is whether or not the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act is constitutional. I think this should be an easy question. The primary issue before the Supreme Court is whether the individual mandate, the minimum coverage requirement, is within the scope of Congress's power. I thought the best indication of the answer to this came on the second day of oral arguments. And in case you're looking, it was the hour and six minute mark on that Tuesday morning. And Justice Sotomayor said to the attorney for the state of Florida, Paul Clement, couldn't Congress raise everyone's taxes to pay for health insurance, but give an exemption to the tax increase of those who already have health insurance? And isn't that really what this law is doing? Now, Mr. Clement pointed out that the Obama administration didn't want to call it a tax increase. But functionally, that's exactly what it is to say that those who don't have health care have to pay an increase in taxes. And if this argument isn't persuasive, isn't it clear that Congress should be able to adopt this law under its power to regulate commerce among the states? As you've learned in your constitutional law classes, the Supreme Court in United States versus Lopez said in part that Congress can regulate economic activities which taken cumulatively have a substantial effect on interstate commerce. Now, the courts that have said that the individual mandate is unconstitutional have said that people who don't buy health insurance aren't engaged in economic activity. But this seems clearly wrong. Each of us will at some point need medical care. If we have children, they have to be vaccinated before they go to public school. If we have a communicable disease, the government can require it be treated. If a person has an automobile accident, they're taken to the local emergency room, which is required by federal law to provide treatment. So every person engaged in economic activity, either the person is purchasing health insurance or the individual is self-insuring, but either way, it's economic activity. Taken cumulatively, health insurance is an $850 billion industry. Healthcare is $2.6 trillion of the gross domestic product, 18% of the gross domestic product. The last Supreme Court case about the Commerce Clause was Gonzalez versus Reich in 2005. There, the Supreme Court said that Congress, under its commerce power, could keep a woman from growing marijuana for her own personal use. If Congress, under the commerce power, could punish Angela Raich for growing marijuana to offset her ill effects from chemotherapy, can't Congress regulate an $850 billion industry? And yet, I have no prediction to offer you. Every lower federal court judge appointed by a Republican president but two voted to strike this law down. Every lower federal court judge appointed by a Democratic president, save one, voted to uphold it. Will the Supreme Court see it through the same partisan lens? The second important matter pending before the Supreme Court was argued just yesterday morning. It's Arizona versus the United States. It involves Arizona's SB 1070. The law declares in its preamble that its goal is to decrease the presence of undocumented immigrants through aggressive law enforcement and attrition. A federal district court judge, Susan Bolton, issued a preliminary injunction in the summer of 2010. She found four provisions are likely to be preempted by federal law. One provision allows Arizona police to question individuals about their immigration status if they have reasonable suspicion they're unlawfully in the country. Now, the law says race isn't to be used, 
But how in the world are the police going to decide when there's reasonable suspicion, but for the surname and the color of the skin? Another provision requires that individuals who are not citizens carry papers showing they're lawfully in the country. Another provision makes it a federal crime for individuals not lawfully in the country to apply for work or to work in the state of Arizona. And another provision allows warrantless arrests and indefinite detention of those who are not lawfully present and requires that if a person's arrested before release, that immigration status be checked. In 1942, in a case called Hines versus Davidowitz, the Supreme Court declared unconstitutional a Pennsylvania law that in some respects was identical. The Supreme Court said that states can't, and I'm quoting, contradict or complement federal immigration law. The Supreme Court long has said that federal immigration law is in the exclusive province of the federal government. Anything the government does with regard to immigration has effects on foreign policy. States can't have a foreign policy of their own. Based on these precedents, this should be an easy case. And yet all accounts of yesterday's oral argument, the Supreme Court's likely to uphold at least some of these provisions of SB 1070. The third important matter pending now before the Supreme Court will be argued at the beginning of October. Review has already been granted. It's a case called Fisher versus University of Texas at Austin. The issue before the Supreme Court is whether colleges and universities can continue to use race as a factor in admission decisions to benefit minorities to enhance diversity. The Supreme Court last addressed this issue in 2003 in Grutter versus Bollinger. There, the Supreme Court ruled five to four that colleges and universities have a compelling interest in a diverse student body, that colleges and universities may use race as one factor among many admissions decisions to enhance diversity to benefit minorities. The opinion in Grutter versus Bollinger was written by Justice Sandra Day O'Connor. She was joined by Justices Stevens, Souter, Ginsburg, and Breyer. Now, the fact that Justices Stevens and Souter are no longer on the court, it's not likely to matter much because they're replaced by Sotomayor and Kagan and will surely vote the same way. But the key difference is that Justice O'Connor has been replaced by Justice Alito. That's an enormous change, this area and so many others. In 2007, Justice Alito joined an opinion by Chief Justice Roberts in parents involved in community schools, or Seattle schools number one, that said that the Constitution requires colorblindness. This leaves no doubt where Justice Alito will line up. There are now five votes on the current court. Roberts, Scalia, Kennedy, Thomas, Alito, that will vote to narrow, if not overrule, Grutter versus Bollinger. For those who believe in diversity, for those who believe that affirmative action is still necessary to remedy a long legacy of discrimination. Everything seems to depend on Anthony Kennedy. In his now 25 years of justice, Anthony Kennedy has never once voted to uphold any affirmative action program. I've been a law professor for 32 years now. I've taught constitutional law and criminal procedure in classes that are almost all white, and those with a significant number of African-American and Latino students. The conversation is radically different in those situations. As Justice O'Connor said, diversity in the classroom is essential if we're going to train the next generation of lawyers, if we're going to remedy the long legacy of discrimination. There seems little doubt that the Supreme Court is going to change the Constitution here, likely dramatically. Fourth and finally, there's one other matter that's not before the Supreme Court, but it's sure to get there next year, and that's the issue of marriage equality for gays and lesbians. In February of this year, the United States Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit in Perry versus Brown declared unconstitutional an initiative in California, Proposition 8, that amended the state constitution to declare that marriage has to be between a man and a woman. On April 4th, 
little less than a month ago, the United States Court of Appeals for the First Circuit put oral arguments as to whether the Federal Defense of Marriage Act is constitutional, or in Section 3 it says that marriage has to be between a man and a woman. The Supreme Court surely will grant review in one of these cases, and I predict it will be in the next year. I think this, too, should be an easy constitutional question. Gays and lesbians should have the same ability to express love and commitment, the same ability to get the benefits of marriage, the same ability to experience the disappointments of marriage <laughs> that opposite couples have long had. I've debated this issue many times, and I'm still baffled by what is the legitimate government interest in denying this to gays and lesbians. I've spoken to many who oppose marriage equality for gays and lesbians, and I said, if you don't like it, then don't marry someone of the same sex. <laughs> but why should others be denied this? But I think this case, like the other three I mentioned, will go so far to telling us what really is the present state of constitutional rights in the United States. I want to conclude with the words of the late Justice Louis Brandeis. He said that the greatest threat to liberty will come from those who act for beneficial purposes. He said that people born to freedom know to resist the tyranny of despots. He said the insidious threat to freedom will come from well-meaning people of zeal with little understanding of what the Constitution is about. We have on the Supreme Court now is talented a group of men and women that ever served on that institution. But I also often wonder whether they really have an understanding of what the Constitution is about. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. I know that the hour is late, but I was asked before if I would take some questions. Um, do you still want to do a little bit of questions now? Is that okay? I don't want to keep anybody too late. Uh, I'm glad to take questions. I know that there are people in another room, um, and so I think what we'll do is I'll repeat the questions, and then I've also promised to go into the other room to have the chance to meet the people there. Um, I'll just repeat the questions so that people in the other room can hear. Sir, please. Sure, it's a great question. The question was the severability of the individual mandate. There were four issues argued in the Supreme Court over six and a half hours at the end of March. If you like Supreme Court trivia, that's the most time spent on any one case since Miranda versus Arizona in 1966. One of the four issues that was argued, and it was on the Wednesday morning, was whether or not the individual mandate is severable from the rest of the statute. In other words, if the individual mandate is declared unconstitutional, does that mean the whole Patient Protection Affordable Care Act has to be struck down or just that provision? The Supreme Court has often said that the test for severability is one of legislative intent. Would Congress likely have adopted the rest of the statute without the part declared unconstitutional? On the one hand, the state of Florida says, that the individual mandate was the linchpin for the law, that the law wouldn't have been adopted without it. On the other hand, the United States government says the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act is 2,700 pages long. It is many things that have nothing to do with the individual mandate, many things that have already gone into effect. It changes Medicare reimbursement to save costs. It requires that chain restaurants disclose nutritional information. It extends a health benefits program for Native Americans. The United States says none of this depends on the individual mandate. I'm reluctant to make predictions. I long ago learned that he who lives by the crystal ball has to learn to eat ground glass. <laughs> I don't think the 
court, if it strikes down the individual mandate, will invalidate the entire statute. I just think that if they strike down the individual mandate, they'll say some of the rest of the statute has to go with it. Um, part of the Affordable Care Act, you know, requires that insurance companies give insurance to individuals even if they have pre-existing conditions. And so somebody can't be denied insurance because they had cancer or diabetes. Um, it also prevents insurance companies from putting caps on recovery from the insurance company in a year or a lifetime. I think if the individual mandate is struck down, those provisions will be struck down with it, but I don't think the rest of the statute will be. Please. Sure. Sure. The question was, can I discuss the Supreme Court's decision concerning GPS devices under cars and how that relates to my more negative portrayal of the Supreme Court and constitutional rights? I've long had a predictive principle when it comes to the Supreme Court and the Fourth Amendment. If the justices can imagine it happening to them, it violates the Fourth Amendment. <laughs> if the justices can't imagine it happens to them, it doesn't violate the Fourth Amendment. So to answer your question, I want to compare two Fourth Amendment cases from this year, 2012. One is what you mentioned. The case is called United States versus Jones. Antoine Jones was suspected of participating in cocaine trafficking. The police went and got a warrant to tap his telephone. They also got a warrant to put a GPS device on his car. The warrant said it had to be put on the car within 10 days of the issuance of the warrant. Now, he put it on the car while the car was in the District of Columbia. Inexplicably, the police waited until the 11th day to put the GPS device on the car, and they did so while the car was in Maryland. <laughs> they tracked the car for 28 days, and then when he was prosecuted for conspiracy to engage in cocaine trafficking, the logs from the tracking were key evidence against him. Everyone agrees that the GPS device was a warrantless was the warrant wasn't valid at the time that it occurred. He was convicted. He was sentenced to life in prison. He was fined a very large amount of money. The United States Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit overturned his conviction, saying putting the GPS device on the car and tracking it without a warrant violated the Fourth Amendment. The Supreme Court unanimously affirmed. I could have predicted this after oral argument. At one moment of the oral argument, Chief Justice Roberts asked the attorney for the government, does this mean that a police officer could have a GPS device on my car without a warrant? <laughs> and then Justice Kennedy said to the attorney for the government, could a police officer slip a GPS device in my pocket without a warrant and follow me around? Once I read those questions, I knew what the outcome of the case was going to be. <laughs> Nine to nothing, the Supreme Court said, it violates the Fourth Amendment. Now, Justice Scalia wrote for a majority of five, his opinion was joined by Roberts, Kennedy, Thomas, and Sotomayor. Justice Scalia said, the Fourth Amendment means the same thing it did when it was adopted in 1791. I always find it in Congress when the court says, now let's talk about GPS devices on cars. <laughs> he said, there was an English case in 1765, Entrick versus Carrington, that involved a constable hiding in a carriage to overhear a conversation. He said that was a trespass, so putting the GPS device on the car violates the Fourth Amendment. <laughs> Justice Alito wrote an opinion concurring the judgment, joined by Ginsburg, Breyer, and Kagan. He said it doesn't make any sense to decide what violates the Fourth Amendment when it comes to GPS devices by looking at 18th century English laws. He said we should focus on whether there's a reasonable expectation of privacy. He said there's a point at which the police following somebody around does become an invasion of the reasonable expectation of privacy. He said we should have legislatures draw that line. Justice Sotomayor wrote a concurring opinion. She said she agrees with Justice Alito more than Justice Scalia. It's puzzling then why she didn't agree with Justice Alito's opinion, which would have made it the majority opinion. She said that she's content here that putting the device on the car was a trespass, and that's a search within the meaning of the Fourth Amendment. But she said, we really need to face the harder questions. How do we deal with, say, a satellite tracking somebody's movement? How do we talk about reasonable expectation of privacy in an era where electronic monitoring is so easy?
Well, let me compare that to a second case that came down just a few weeks ago. The case is called Florence versus Board of Freeholders. It involves a man who was arrested by mistake. No one denies that it was completely a mistake. He was taken to jail, and he was subjected to a strip search. He was then moved to another jail, and he was again subjected to a strip search in front of guards and other inmates. After six days, he was released. The mistake was discovered. No charges were ever brought against him. But he brought a civil suit saying, subjecting him to a humiliating, degrading strip search without any reasonable suspicion violated his Fourth Amendment rights. The Supreme Court five to four ruled against him. Justice Kennedy wrote, joined by Robert Scalia, Thomas, and Alito. Justice Kennedy said that the court has to defer to jails and prisons. And if they believe that strip searches are necessary without any reasonable suspicion, they have to be able to do it. Now, how do I explain these two cases? I know it sounds cynical, but the justices can't imagine they'd be the ones arrested by mistake. But they can imagine somebody might put a GPS device on their car. Sir. Sure. Sure. The question was about Citizens United and should businesses have the right to participate directly in elections. The fourth theme that I identified tonight was how much this is a pro-business court. No case better illustrates that than Citizens United versus Federal Election Commission. And since I was focusing on last term's cases, my primary illustration, I didn't mention it. But it so exemplifies the theme that I'm talking about. In 1907, Congress passed a law that said that corporations could not contribute money to candidates for federal elective office. In 1946, this was extended to unions. But corporations and unions have very clever lawyers. They found a way to circumvent this. They would simply take out the ads directly, putting them in TV, newspapers, and the like. So in 1974, Congress amended the federal election law to say that corporations and unions couldn't take out ads directly, urging the election of particular candidates or the feet of others. But corporations and unions, with their clever lawyers, figured out a way to circumvent this. Issue ads. The ad would never say, vote for John Jones, vote against Mary Smith, but it would praise or criticize the candidate's views on issues. Run an election would leave no doubt. So in 2001, in the Bipartisan Campaign Finance Reform Act, known as McCain-Feingold, the Congress, President Bush signed it, prohibited such issue ads for or against identifiable candidates within a period of time for primary general elections. In January of 2003, in McConnell versus Federal Election Commission, the Supreme Court upheld this limit on corporate and union spending. Justice O'Connor and Justice Stevens wrote a joint opinion for the court. They talked about the long tradition of restricting corporate and union expenditures in elections. They talked about fear that corporate wealth might distort the outcome of elections. They talked about how when corporations are spending money in elections, they're really spending shareholders' money without consent. Seven years later, in January 2010, in Citizens United versus Federal Election Commission, the Supreme Court overturned McConnell. So you wonder, what changed in those seven years? Did the court find some musty history of the First Amendment that led it to believe that it made a mistake? No, the only difference, again, was Justice Alito replaced Justice O'Connor. He joined the dissenters from McConnell. Now, I find, to use a mild word, so much irony in this. The conservatives on the court, like Justice Scalia and Thomas, have told us for decades that rights should be found in the Constitution only if they were clearly intended by the framers. I challenge anyone to find an indication of the framers' intent that they meant to protect the right of corporations to spend unlimited amounts of money to get candidates elected or defeated. For decades, conservatives have said they believe in judicial restraint. They oppose judicial activism. I've never been sure what judicial activism means. I've always thought it's a label that people use for decisions they don't like. But if judicial activism means anything, 
Isn't it some deference to the political process? This law was adopted overwhelmingly by Congress signed by the president. Doesn't it mean respect for precedent? And here they overturn a decision that's seven years old. I do worry about what this is going to mean for elections in the United States. We've already seen its effects with regard to the super PACs and the primaries. I worry about the ability of corporations through large spending to decide elections in small towns, in smaller communities. I worry also, and this thing is so really discussed, about the candidates who will never run for office because they know of the ability of the corporation to simply outspend them. I think in terms of the practical effect on the political system, this is going to be enormous, and I think it's going to be devastating. And I think it reflects the desire of the current court very much to protect business and corporations. Um, just a couple more questions, and then please, please. The question is about another decision from June 23rd, 2011, Stern v. Marshall. I know it's 9 o'clock, and I know talking about federal jurisdiction isn't what's most going to keep you awake. So let me try to do this briefly. Um, the reason you might have heard of the case is that the marshal in this case is Anna Nicole Smith. She's called Vicki Lynn Marshall. Remember, she married a much older man in Texas, a very wealthy man by the name of Howard Marshall. When he died, a fight ensued over his estate. Um, Vicki Lynn Marshall claimed that she should be able to inherit. The son, Pierce Marshall, said he should get to inherit. Vicki Lynn Marshall, Anna Nicole Smith filed a bankruptcy petition in the United States District Court for the Central District of California. And Pierce Marshall, the son, filed a proof of claim for defamation. Vicki Lynn Marshall filed a counterclaim asserting that there had been tortious interference with the recovery under the estate. The bankruptcy judge, Samuel Bufford, ruled in favor of Vicki Lynn Marshall and awarded her $425 million. The district court judge, David Carter, reduced that to $88 million. But $88 million is still an inheritance that I'm sure any of us would welcome. And I must say, should you recover $88 million, please remember the University of Puerto Rico Law School. The dean is nodding her head at that. And subsequent to that, the probate court in Texas ruled in favor of Pierce Marshall. So the issue before the Supreme Court was, could the bankruptcy court issue a final judgment, in which case Vicki Lynn Marshall, or since she's no longer alive, more precisely her heirs win, or can the bankruptcy court not issue a final judgment, in which case there's no preclusion in the Texas probate court decision stands, Pierce Marshall, more precisely since he's no longer alive, his heirs win. The Supreme Court rules five to four that the bankruptcy court could not issue a final judgment. Chief Justice Roberts wrote for the court, joined by Justice Scalia, Kennedy, Thomas, and Alito. He said that bankruptcy courts cannot issue final judgments as to such state law counterclaims. Now, there's many things that are puzzling about this. Why did the court split ideologically on an issue of bankruptcy court jurisdiction? This isn't abortion or affirmative action or gay marriage. Well, I think this reflects a very important underlying division on the current court. The conservative majority is very formalistic. They believe the Constitution meant what it did when it was adopted. They don't look at functional considerations. The liberal justices, much more functional, looking at the enormous caseload of bankruptcy courts and the problem of saying a bankruptcy court can't issue a final judgment over such matters. Now, the underlying rationale of this case makes no sense to me. The holding was that the bankruptcy court could not issue a final judgment on the state law matter because bankruptcy judges don't have life tenure under Article Three of the Constitution. Who usually decides state law claims? State judges, who rarely in this country have life tenure. So what's so bad about the bankruptcy court deciding a state law matter? Well, there is enormous confusion over what this applies to. 
Can consent cure the problem? That's not just about bankruptcy judges. Magistrate judges at the federal level don't have life tenure. Is it unconstitutional for them to issue final judgments with the consent of the parties? I think that the Supreme Court is going to have to deal with this and deal with this soon. I think if the court continues to be formalistic, the effect in the bankruptcy courts, the magistrate judges, federal agencies is going to be enormous. My prediction, given what the qualification I made a moment ago, is that I think the Supreme Court is going to say that consent can cure the problem. And then, so long as there's consent, the bankruptcy judges can issue final judgments, magistrate judges can issue final judgments. Now, I don't think that that makes sense given the underlying rationale of the case, but I think when they realize the practical consequence of doing anything else, they're likely to come to that conclusion. How about one more question, please? The question was, does what I said tonight, does what I've written in my book indicate that constitutional law is not about the rule of law but naked preferences to amend the Constitution to then eliminate life tenure for justices? Let me say a few things in response. First, I believe that constitutional law has always been a product of the justice who are on the court at that moment in time. Take Marbury versus Madison. There's nothing in Article Three of the Constitution that mentions the authority of courts to strike down legislative or judicial actions. That was very much a product of John Marshall being Chief Justice at that moment in time. Think of the period from the late 19th century to the 1930s when the Supreme Court struck down over 200 federal, state, and local laws regulating the economy. It's a group of justices who were deeply conservative economically conservative, morally conservative, politically conservative. And the basis of those preferences invalidated everything from child labor laws to minimum wage laws, next hour laws, and so much more. Think of the time from 1954 to 1969 when Earl Warren was Chief Justice. And what the Warren Court did in desegregating schools or ensuring one person, one vote, incorporating the Bill of Rights, Expand the rights of criminal defendants. That was also the preferences of those justices. Now, what we have and have now is the most conservative court since the mid-1930s, and it's not surprising it's about the preferences of those justices. I think it's inevitable that constitutional law reflects the human beings that are there. The Constitution is written in such broad, open, textured language that judging has to go on. The judges have to decide what's the best meaning of these phrases for this point in time. What's different about this court is that it's pretending it's doing something else. That this is a court that is the most arrogant in history, but is masquerading as there's some form of judicial humility and judicial modesty. They're pretending that they're deciding based on the framers' intent, when the framers can't tell us the answer to any of these questions. Think about affirmative action. If there's any place where framers' intent is clear, it's that the drafters of the 14th Amendment intended race-conscious programs. They created many, like what we call affirmative action today. But you don't hear Justice Scalia and Thomas talking about framers' intent when it comes to that. So my criticism is not that the court is putting their values into the Constitution. There's no way to value free judging. My criticism is they don't admit that that's what they're doing and they pretend it's something else. Now, I just want to go to the last thing you say. I've now been persuaded the term limits for Supreme Court justices would be a good idea. 
I think we should amend the Constitution, maybe we can do it by federal statute, to have 18-year terms for Supreme Court justices so that a vacancy would occur every two years. I think 18 years is long enough for somebody to develop expertise. I think 18 years lessens the likelihood that there'll be a justice who's truly out of touch times. I think that a vacancy every two years would give all presidents about the same ability to shape the court. Otherwise, historical accidents matter so much. Jimmy Carter didn't get one Supreme Court justice to pick. Richard Nixon got four in his first two years. So I believe that judges need independence. I believe in long periods of time and that they shouldn't be reviewed or be reappointed so they're not deciding to please any constituency. But I've become convinced that something like 18-year terms would be long enough. You've been so wonderful tonight. Thank you so very much.